Shabbat Shalom. We give honor. We give honor to the Most High today and every day. We welcome our repeat visitors and new visitors alike. Joining us today says that you love our Creator, the Most High, Yahuwah, also known as God. You also desire to increase your scriptural and spiritual knowledge. We hope that you do indeed receive these two things here today. Home of Prayer Congregation loves and welcomes all who love and serve the Most High. Again, thank you very much for joining us today. In the name of Yahushua, also known as Jesus, we all come to the Most High, Yahuwah, also known as God, for repentance, to worship, to praise, and for knowledge. Please forgive any sins any of us may have committed, known or unknown so that our prayers may be heard and answered. Blessed are you, Yahuwah our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to wear fringes. I led you out of Egypt to be your Elohim. You shall love Yahuwah your Elohim and keep his laws and commandments. You shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your being. Set these words which I command you this day upon your heart. Teach them faithfully to your children. Speak of them in your home and on your and on your way, when you lie down and when you rise up. We praise you, you who are our Elohim, eternal king, maker of light and creator and darkness, giver of peace and creator of all things. In your mercy you give light to the earth and to all the living. And in your goodness you renew the work of creation again and again, day by day. Blessed is Yahuwah, creator. Hallelujah. Now, our rabbi will lead us in the Shema. Go ahead when you're ready and may Father bless you today, rabbi. Thank you and may he bless you and all that are on the line this morning. Hallelujah. Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahuwah Echad, Baruch Shem Kavad, Melkatu Laolam, Vayed. Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our God is one. Blessed is his name now and forevermore. And we thank you, Father, for this wonderful Sabbath. We bless you, we baruch you, we Love you and we worship you. And we thank you. Hallelujah. Back, back to you, uh, Sister Bethany. Sister Bethany? Before we go any further, I want to remind everyone that you can read about our Shabbat conferences on our website at Home of Prayer congregation.com again that is home of prayer congregation.com now sister regina um, is going to go when you're ready sister you may proceed okay thank you very much uh, minister brian will be going after me um i wanted to, first of all i did want to observe the order uh that is spoken of in the scriptures i did want him to go first but um, he's the one who wanted me to go before him. I just wanted to let you guys know that. Um, the story of the prodigal son has been in my thoughts lately. And when I saw the email that Rabbi sent out about today, I felt like it fit um, well. So I, w- I want to talk about that a little bit. It's only going to take me about five or ten minutes at the most. Um this story was told by Yahushua, Jesus, in Luke 15. There were two sons. The younger son asked for his inheritance early. And this makes me think of how so many of us want things now and easy. The adversary takes advantage when we don't want to earn what we want or willing to wait for the appropriate time. Usually when we do this, things don't work out right. When we want blessings from the Most High, do we have, have we asked ourselves, have I earned what I'm asking for? So have we prayed every day? 
Have we trusted in his wisdom and timing in every situation? Have we treated our fellow humans with the fruits of the Spirit as taught in Galatians 5? Do we avoid the works of the flesh as also taught in Galatians 5? Do we keep the Sabbath and keep it holy? Do we keep the commandments? There's more self-reflections to consider who we have earned what we're asking for, but I think you guys get the gist. Yahuwah, also known as God, wants to bless us, but like a parent to a child, we aren't going to reward a disobedient or lazy child. And he doesn't either. If it ever seems like he does, it's only because of a promise or a prophecy. So this son converted his inheritance to money, left his father's farm, and traveled to a faraway country. You see how he wanted to get away from the place of hard work? What lengths do we go to to get away, or get far away from hard work or even just consistency? The son spent up all of his inheritance and then a famine struck the land he was in. As we all know, in times of famine, only the wealthy eat decently. So had he have spent his money wisely, he would have either had some food stored up or had enough money to buy food even in famine or been able to pack up and move to where there was food. But it took this son being covetous of the food the swine were eating for him to come to his senses. It's amazing how much reflection we can do on an empty stomach. And this is something to think about when we, when it comes to fasting. When we fast, we too have more clarity and more open to understanding and wisdom. But as I often joke to my husband, the difference between fasting and starvation is choice. We choose to fast, but people don't choose to starve. Okay, so the son, he didn't set out to fast. He was indeed starving. But you see how the results were the same? This is proof that when we, when we deny the flesh, it has a harder time getting in the way of our spiritual connection to the Most High. So the son made his way back to his father and humbled himself as he begged to just be a servant so he could at least feed his belly. Instead of anger, or hatred, or mockery, or I told you so, his father welcomed him with forgiveness and joy. He lavished him and prepared a feast. And this is what the Most High does for us when we lose our way. And that forgiveness is at the ready because of the sacrifice of our Messiah, Yahushua, Jesus. So when you feel as though you have been forgiven, make sure you give thanks to Yahushua for his sacrifice. The other son was jealous and angry at the treatment his younger brother received. He felt like he had always worked hard and done right by his father. He couldn't understand how his brother could do what he did and be so easily forgiven, taken back in, and lavished upon. Haven't we ever felt like that son when we've looked at the people of the world and how they seem to have so much or have it so easy in life? That's because they aren't being trained up by the Most High to be worthy of heaven. Those of us who have attached ourselves to him and his commandments are being trained and made worthy of heaven. They have their easier lives on earth. But we will have it easier in the afterlife for all eternity. So, brothers and sisters, work hard now while you live and breathe to have it easier after your flesh dies and you are in heaven. Also, when someone comes to attach themselves to the Most High and His commandments or is returning, embrace them with love and be joyful for them. Lastly, Don't wait until you are coveting the food of the swine or the spoils of the worldly people to self-reflect. And that's what I have today, and now I'm going to hand it over to Minister Brian. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, my dear wife. 
<clears throat> and one flesh partner. <laughs> All praises to the Most High on another glorious Sabbath. A topic that usually comes up um, when I'm listening to Rabbi is the people, uh, she's trying to tell the people, um, listen, the, the laws and the commandments, those are the things that we still have to operate in from time to time so you can understand. So what the people usually say is no one can be perfect and no one can be blameless. That's what they say, even though the scripture says otherwise. So there's a conflict here on what blameless is and what's perfect. So I have to go into one of my favorite books, Job, and it includes a statement that Job was blameless and upright. This cannot mean that Job was sinless. So right away we're going to get into the meat of everything, right? Because it it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Elohim. So then what does that mean then when they call him blameless? Can't be the same thing. So that must mean that there's a definition here that is invisible to what we believe perfect and blameless is. So that's what we're going to take a look at today and how to get to this blameless and perfect and upright and just state. The Hebrew word translated blameless is tam and can be translated as blameless, perfect, or upright. All of these words are synonymous with each other. The same word is used in Proverbs, which states, The bloodthirsty hate a person of integrity and seek to kill the upright. A blameless person is someone who life exhibits integrity. When you read the book of Job, integrity is used a lot, at least in, I think, the King James Version. Upright in Job is translated of the Hebrew word yasha, meaning upright or just. This word is used in parallel in this verse with blameless. In Psalm 37, 37, the same word is used in parallel with those who seek peace. Consider the blameless, observe the upright, a future awaits for those who seek peace. So, when you're looking at this, the blameless and the upright people, they fear Elohim. They fear the Most High. And that same person is one who turns from evil. They turn away from it. So what I'm trying to say is Job was blameless and upright in that he was a man of integrity who trusted Elohim as his redeemer, sincerely worshipped Yahuwah, loved his family, and was consistent in his walk with Elohim. When you look at Job, that's what it tells you. Following the description of Job's riches and children, and the text mentions his feast that he held for his sons, a specific example of Job's blameless and upright nature is given right here. When a period of feasting has run its course, Job would make arrangements for his children to be purified. Why did he do these things? Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. 
So isn't this what we do with our children? Mm -hmm. We pray that they don't steal, that they don't go out there and be shot, that they don't uh, get a, a woman pregnant or, or get pregnant. So verse 5 contains some significant details in this, in this explanation of what upright, blameless, perfect, just man. It explains why. This goes for women, even though they say just man all the time. It's the same thing. Because in Messiah, you need the Jew, the Greek, the female, or male, right? So these are the things that we're all supposed to be doing. So, one, Job offered, uh, Job offered uh, sacrifices to Elohim. That's number one. You are supposed to be offering sacrifices very similar in the way of fasting, praying, worshiping. That's what we're supposed to do with the Messiah. He was concerned for the spiritual welfare of his children. I don't know anyone who is a true believer that that has children or is a guardian or has a flock as a pastor or any of those who is not concerned for the spiritual welfare of their people. He feared Yahuwah since he was concerned about his son cursing Elohim, his son's cursing Elohim, he feared that they would be destroyed. So there was fear in him, which is how I feel too. He was sensitive even toward unknown sin, and he lived with this attitude continuously. He continuously thought this. All of these factors serve as examples of Job's blameless and upright life, and they set the stage for the challenge for Satan brings before Elohim. So one of the main things is we talk about this on, on – oh, I was going to say home prayer. Oh, yeah, it is home prayer. I was thinking of uh, – The Torah study. No, not the Torah study. Blow the trumpet. I'll blow the trumpet. Yes. The program. Yes. So what we usually hear is rabbi talk about the law, and people say we're not under the law, and then the people say no one can do the entire law. They keep saying this over and over. They talk about circumcision, and they talk about a lot of different things. But a lot of the time when I'm listening to them, they leave out certain things when they bring Scripture up. So I want to be clear about the conflict over circumcision and the law. So let's go to Acts 15, verse 1 and 21, so we can get clarification. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So, so this is what they think Rabbi, me, and other people are saying, that you can only be saved under the circumcision which Moses gave and the law. That's what they're thinking. Even though we quote um, the things that the Messiah said, you have people that thought the same exact way, the same things, and it caused a problem here. So let's see how they resolve this problem. Continue. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. All right, so 
right now we have the brother, everybody's happy, right? You've got the Gentiles being converted, they're starting to get understanding, but there's this thing that arose because according to the scriptures, according to the law with Moses, these people are not altogether wrong, the ones that talk about the circumcision. And you're going to see this in a little bit, that it's not exactly what you think it is. Just because they are talking about not worrying about the Gentiles at this point, you're going to see certain words in here, and I want you to pay attention to the words. Go ahead and continue. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they reported all things that Elohim had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, is this wrong? Did, did the Messiah do this? Was he circumcised? Yep. Did he keep the law of Moses? Yes. yes. He did. So they're not wrong, right? So when Rabbi, myself, or other people out there say these things, we're not wrong. But you're going to see how some people, when they look at the Scriptures, they only look at a small portion of the Scriptures. So we're looking at this entire Scripture here to see what is actually going on. Because remember, there's a dispute. Everybody has a point here, right? Mm -hmm. So let's continue. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago Elohim chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So Elohim, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Okay. Now, here comes the words that people think about all the time. Continue. Now, therefore, why do you test Elohim by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Now, what is the yoke that they're talking about? Are they talking about the law? Are they talking about circumcision? What are they actually saying? Not too sure, right? We're going to see as we go along. But we believe that through the grace of Yahushua Messiah, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So they were talking about being equal, of how to be saved. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, continue. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders Elohim had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how Elohim at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek Yahushua. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to Elohim from eternity are all his works. Now, listen to this, because... <clears throat> This is what the people quote all the time, but they don't continue with really understanding what it means. Go ahead. 
Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to Elohim. Stop. Okay. Do you see the words? Mm -hmm. Who are turning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say who are believers and they mm -hmm. continue in understanding what the truth is. Right. It says Gentiles who are turning. They're in the middle of right. getting ready to understand. So what is what are they telling them to do? But that we write to them to absolutely from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. And this is where they usually stop. And this is what I hear all the time. They don't go to verse 21 at all, which ends it by saying this. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Why is that being said? It is because these Gentiles are turning to Elohim. They're not there yet. They don't know what the laws and stuff are. So this, this is a problem right now. So what they're telling them right now is, well, well let's just do some basic stuff right now. Mm -hmm. Just abstain from pollu uh, the, the polluted idols and sexual morality, and things strangled from blood, and y'all will be okay. When you get to the synagogues, they read about Moses and the law all the time, on every Sabbath. So if there was no commandments or laws, then they couldn't go to even a Sabbath, right? Mm -hmm. So why would they put the Sabbath in there if it didn't matter? Mm -hmm. They would have to go to a synagogue on the Sabbath, in order to listen to the people read, do you think the churches were set up or, or the congregations were, were truly set up at this time? No. This was an ax. We see later in history that this happened. So who are turning to Elohim? So while they are learning, they should abstain from those things that we talked about. And then, once they do that, once they get to a synagogue or somebody that knows about the law of Moses, they're supposed to read it to them. How else will they not? How else will they know what they are or aren't supposed to do? Right? If they don't even know they're not supposed to steal, how how are they going to know? They just arbitrarily know? No. That's the reason why they didn't put a burden on them yet. It's because they have to learn over a period of time. And that's when you have baby believers. That's what we call them, right? Yeah. They have a little bit of milk, and then you have to explain and expound it to them. It's the same way with your kids. They don't know much. They know TV, this, mm -hmm. what that is, but they don't know the intricacies about what a te television really is until you explain it to them. Mm -hmm. But for that period of time, it's just good enough to know that a TV exists and a screen comes on. Mm -hmm. So let's continue. So I wanted to get to the meat of everything first instead of waiting to the end. So now we're going to look at some of these people that were called just. Because remember, blameless, perfect, Upright, just, all the same in those words. So let's see what it says in Genesis 6, verse 9 to 10. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, do you see that? He was a just and perfect man. It says all have sinned. So we already know the sin part of it because it says we all have. But what did he do that was different? He listened to the Most High and did what he told him. That made him perfect. Let's see somebody else. Genesis 12, 
1 to 18. Because the people keep saying you can't be perfect and you can't be blameless, and yet it's written in the scriptures that people were perfect and people were blameless. So how are they saying that there's no way that you can do this? They're not really understanding the, the verbiage and the words. They're not understanding that it's still under the concept that all people have sinned. We're born into it. Go ahead. Now, Yahuwah had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. You see, this is how it starts. He's looking at him because of the things that he must have been doing. Because every time Father picks someone, it seems to be like this. It seems to be like they followed what Father said, and he accounted it to, to them for righteousness. So let's continue. So Abram departed as Yahuwah had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Then Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to Yahuwah, who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to Yahuwah and called the name and called on the name of Yahuwah. So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Okay, you see how he set up everything? He was ready to listen. He was ready to do whatever it takes. So one of the makings of somebody being perfect, just, and blameless is being a peacemaker. Let's look at Genesis 13, 8 to 18, so we can see what's going on. So Abram said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. So do you see Abraham, well, Abram at this point, because his name wasn't changed yet, mm -hmm. was a peacemaker and loved his brethren. Does that not sound like what Messiah says? If you have hatred for your brother, you're wrong. But if you love your brother, you're not going to strive with them. You separate, right? Because you can have disagreements with people, which is what happened here with the herdsmen. They couldn't get along. So he said, okay, well, let's separate because we don't want to hurt our brethren. We don't want anybody to die here. That was wise, good choice, most high, in picking this person. Let's continue. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well with water everywhere. Before Yahuwah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the Garden of Yahuwah, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zawar. Now, I want you to think about this. He let Lot choose, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what Lot chose. It's not that Abraham chose this. He allowed Lot to do it, and Lot chose this. 
So he chose the area where Sodom and Gomorrah was, which we know what happened to them. Yeah. He didn't choose very wisely, but any time that Abraham does something, there's always going to be a blessing to him. Go ahead. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against Yahuwah. And Yahuwah said to Abram, after Lot separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Now, you see how it allowed Lot to choose first? Mm -hmm. This is what the Most High does for you when he considers you righteous and upright. He makes what the other person did look very trivial mm -hmm. because of the striving. The fact that he wanted to make peace with Lot and his herdsmen, this is the blessing that he got. Continue. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to Yahuwah. So, we have established that he listens to the Mosai. We've established that he's a peacemaker. Let's see if he protects his brethren as well as separates from them. Genesis 14, 8 to 22. I'm giving you these to let you know how to be perfect because if Abraham is continuously talked about in faith, then we have to look at Abraham to figure out what he's doing to cause him to be perfect also. Thanks. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Siddim against Chador Lomer, king of Elam, title king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Okay, so... There was a fight amongst people. And you're going to see that Lot was in the middle of this. It wasn't that he wanted to be a partaker or anything like that. It was that they were fighting. Tim. Now, the Valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there. And the remainder fled into the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. All right. So, let's look at this. As of today, with the Messiah, when you find out your brother and sister is in trouble, do you say, wow, well, I'm glad I didn't have to deal with anything like that. Better you Man. than me. <laughs> Oof, they're going through some stuff. No, no. 
interceding is what needs to happen immediately. Everybody should be getting somewhere and praying and fasting for whatever is happening because a brother and sister is being attacked. Are we doing this? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what Abraham did. Abraham, as soon as he heard that his brother was captured and the brethren, he went and prepared himself. It tells us how to prepare in the New Testament. Putting on the full armor of the Most High is how we are supposed to be trained servants to get ready to do battle. That's how we do battle up to today. We don't go out there with guns and knives and tanks and kill people. What we do is we use the fruits of the Spirit. Go ahead. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. Yeah, because it wouldn't be anything without the women and the people too, right? That's right. Because they just have a bunch of men talking. Yeah, yeah, we just, you know what? Where my wife at? Yeah. Where the women folks? Yeah, we can't have any children. No, tell me. You know. Guys won't go back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the Valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of Chedor, Laomer, and the kings who were with him. So we find out that Abraham fought for his brother and sister. Sure did. So, and the women. Yeah. And everybody. And their stuff. And, everybody, and, their, stuff and their stuff, that's right. So, <laughs> that's what we have to be praying for our brothers and sisters. And if we can help them from time to time, we help them from time to time if we can. Yeah. All right. So, now we go to the next thing of Abraham's integrity, right? Like we talked about Job and his integrity, which we'll go over that in a little bit. So tithing is one of the things that people talk about all the time. So let's see if Abraham even did anything like that. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of Elohim Most High. <laughs> and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of Elohim Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be Elohim Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the person and take the goods for yourself. Now listen to this. This is where he is not going to turn to the left hand or turn to the right. You've heard that saying in the scriptures before. Watch what he says. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Yahuwah, Elohim, most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Do you, do you see this? The king of Sodom actually spoke to Abraham before, right here. And he is trying to entice him to go against the oath that he told the Most High, I will not do it. I can guarantee you the Most High and him had a conversation about the king of Sodom before this even transpired. Mm -hmm. So, you, because it's never really said when he did this, but you see that it was. Mm -hmm. So, he's not going to go to the right or to the left. Except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. Nair, Eschal, and Mamre, let them take their portion. You can't bribe him, nope. and he becomes a dangerous man. The yep. dangerous people 
are the people that are going to tell the truth. You don't want to be around those people if you're a liar and you're a thief. You don't want to be around them because they will, what do they call it, squeal on you. Yeah. Right? They'll tell on you. And that makes them a bad person because they tell the truth. No. Shouldn't be like that. Go ahead. I remind you when people say, everybody has a price. Well, apparently, Abraham didn't have a price. (laughs) Messiah had a price. He paid it for it. Oh, he did, didn't he? Absolutely. So, the next thing that he did was a covenant had to be made with Abraham, right? Because he did these things because he knew to do them. It was it was it was like it was put in him to do these things. So let's look at Genesis 17, 1 to 27. When Abram was 99 years old, 99. Yahuwah appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty Elohim. Walk before me and be blameless. You see that word is used with Abraham? Mm-hmm. He wants him to be blameless. So let's see what he's doing with Abraham. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and Elohim talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. If you ever have watched Star Wars at all. Do you see what the evil people do when they recruit someone? Temptation? No, they change their name. Oh, you yeah. Think, you think that that's a, a, a coincidence that they do that? So now Anakin Skywalker is no longer Anakin Skywalker. Now he's Darth Vader. Someone else. Mm-hmm. If you're in boot there's, camp, your name is Maggot. There's a meaning. There's, there's <laughs> meanings behind when they do things yes. like this. Yes. They stole mm-hmm. from how they see the Most High doing things. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Continue. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generation for an everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant, and I want you to remember that, everlasting, which means does not stop, continue. To be Elohim to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their Elohim. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generation. All right, so I want to know what this covenant is that they're supposed to keep with him. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Hold on. I thought Moses was the one that that gave the the law in circumcision. No. But that's what it said, right? That's what they said earlier. Mm -hmm. Moses and the law, and weren't they fighting over the circumcision? So who came first, Abraham or Moses? Abraham. Okay. So this was before yeah. the law was even given. Oh. Right? Yeah. All right. Well, let's continue. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generation, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money 
must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now, who gave this? And who was established this covenant with? It says Abraham and his seed, not Moses and his seed. Mm -hmm. Abraham. Moses understands this circumcision because it was passed down into that law so they can see a written document or a written on stone, where, yeah. where, well, however they wrote it, so they can see it now. It's just a better way of making people understand what this covenant was and what the circumcision was. Mm -hmm. So when you go back to the New Testament and you listen to what they said in Acts, no, the people weren't exactly wrong about uncircumcision. It's because people have explained it in a way where people are getting confused. It was a covenant between them. Nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. What is it going to hurt by doing this? Down there? Well, I mean, it's <laughs> going to hurt. So, <laughs> so let's see what Abraham uh, is, is going to do with this. Because circumcision started around here, which probably started earlier than this, if we can find scriptures to support it somewhere down the road. Continue. And the, and the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay. So when he is there, when they were talking to the Gentiles early on, like that, this is what their mindset was. It wasn't like, you know, they were saying that the law is just going to save everyone. They were saying, well, you have to do this too because this is part of the covenant. I guess you just don't know that. But no, of course they don't because they're Gentiles. They don't know anything about that kind of stuff. Or maybe some of them do, but a lot of them don't. So what did they do? They simplified stuff because they were turning to the Most High. And once they understood what they were supposed to be doing a little bit better, they were supposed to go to the synagogues on the Sabbath and learn what all this is about. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and continue. And the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> that Elohim said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to Elohim, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. <laughs> then Elohim said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold. I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and Elohim went up from Abraham. So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, who were born in his house, and all who had bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very same day. So the very same day that he told them this, he had everybody do this. If that is not obedience, I don't know what is. Everyone, except the females, of course. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they didn't have a chance to run away. <laughs> As Elohim had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So, why is that important? It's because the covenant that started with him, he had to start on that day. But it talks about the eighth day, right, for children? Yes. From then on. Mm-hmm. But you see that when you're a Gentile, you could have been 80-something years old, and you could have still had this done yes. at the time. Go ahead and continue. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. And all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. But the the majority of the people here understand, well, I'm sorry. If you don't understand this, the circumcision of the heart is what is truly looked at. Before Abraham was circumcised in the flesh, he was already circumcised in the heart because you see he followed whatever the Most High had said even before the covenant was made, telling him to get out of this land, telling him to move, telling him to do these things. He was following whatever the Most High had told him to do, told him to go and walk up the, the, breadth, the breadth and length of where your people are going to have this land, told him all these things, and he went and he did it. This was before he established that covenant. So let's look at the person that we started talking about, Job. This is Job 1, 1 through 5. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared Elohim and shunned evil. All right. Do you see? He was blameless. Perfect is another word to use it. So how do you dispute that? The Most High is talking about this man's blameless. And we're going to get to his part in a few minutes. Yes. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, which I think, does that mean birthdays? Mm -hmm. And would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Do you see? Very similar mm-hmm. to Abraham. Abraham rushed out there mm-hmm. and protected his brother. He is a little bit more spiritual on this side mm-hmm. when you look at Job and what he was doing. <clears throat> so, we start to look at the character and what the Most High thinks about him. So, that's Job 1, 6 to 8. Now, there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahuwah, and Satan also came among them. And Yahuwah said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered Yahuwah and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then Yahuwah said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? All right, so now now, not only the narrator is telling you that he's upright and blameless, we're about to hear what the Most High thinks about him. 
that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears Elohim and shuns evil. That means that any time Satan is around or anybody evil that is around, he separates himself from that evil or looks down at the evil mm-hmm. or stops the evil, can't stand the evil. That's what he does. This is one of the parts of how to be blameless. Fearing the Most High, getting away from evil, not continuously being in it. So in this, we're going to see some of his friends actually explained how Job was before, even though they keep trying to put him down and keep telling him that you sin, but we don't know what sin it is, we're about to hear a few words from Eliphaz the Tumanite. This is Job 4, 1 to 5. That Eliph, Eliph, Eliphaz. Eliphaz, thank you. The Tumanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Yes, yes, see, he's saying, I'm tired of you just constantly moaning about stuff. Why do I have to hear this? So now he's telling them what he used to do, what Job used to do. Surely you have instructed many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. So, so. He's instructed many. He was a teacher. He had strengthened the weak hands. Anytime somebody needed help, he did it. These are the attributes of making him the way he is, blameless and perfect. I want you to keep seeing that there is going to be uh, an ongoing theme here. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling. So he would be like, listen, I got your back. Don't worry about it. I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to give you some money because I know you don't have any. I understand that your wife is due, so I'm going to help out with that too. Continue. But now it comes upon you, and you are weary. So you see how he's putting them down? He did all these things for the other people. That's what makes him who he is. So as, while he is upset, he is mounting a defense for himself. And in his defense, you get to see more of his attributes. And Job 29, because I know you, you keep dogging me about not saying what it is, Job 29, 1 to 25. Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when Elohim watched over me, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of Elohim was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were around me, when my steps were bathed with cream and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. When I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the aged rose and stood. They rose and stood up. They're ready to hear this man talk because this guy had wisdom. The princes refrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles was hushed and their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me. When the eye saw, then it approved me because I delivered the poor who cried out. Stop. So he delivered the poor. Does that sound like the Beatitudes, does that sound like the law where people are helping the poor, right? Mm-hmm. Does it sound like the Messiah telling people 
to help the poor? Remember he told that guy, mm -hmm. sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me. It's an attribute. This was before the Messiah was there. Continue. The fatherless and the one who had no helper. See? He helped the fatherless. Those are people that the fathers are not around anymore. So what happens to them? They fall by the wayside, right? Mm -hmm. They run amok. They don't know where they're going. He's helped those people. Continue. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me. Somebody that died. Wow. He's helping them. That's Does that sound like the Samaritan? Go ahead. Mm. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Do you see how he's helping the widows? Also, that's in the scriptures. That's in part of the law. We're supposed to be helping the widows. Continue. I put on righteousness. And it clothes me. Sounds like the fruits of the Spirit and the, the armor of the Most High. Continue. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I, I was eyes to the blind. So he helped the blind. And I was feet to the lame. He helped the lame. I was a father to the poor. He helped the poor. And I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked. So he hates the wicked. And I plucked the victim from his teeth. He saves him. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. My root is spread out to the waters, and the dew lies all night on my branch. My glory is fresh within me. And my bow, my bow is renewed in my hand. Men listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel. That's how wise he was. After my words, they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them as dew. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the spring rain. If I mocked at them, they did not believe it. And the light of my countenance they did not cast down. I chose the way for them and sat as chief. So I dwelt as a king in the army and one who comforts mourners. Do you see how these are the attributes of the Messiah? Yes. This was a long time ago, and he had those attributes. This is the type of people that the Messiah is looking for to head up his congregation, these type of people. He told the people at that generation, a faithless and adulterous generation, is the generation that he had to deal with. If he had people like this in the generation, everything would be really smooth, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. People would be helping each other. So let's continue with some of the things. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going I'm to say it because I need it to do this. Job 31, 1 to 40. But I want to say this. You're going to see the same things. He's still talking to his friends. So go ahead and start with five. Oh, at five. If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has taken to the feet, let me be weighed on honest scales that Elohim may know my integrity. All right, so he's talking about being false and being deceitful. He's saying that if I did this thing, then I should be punished. So he's saying I didn't do these things, but if I did, I should be punished. So lying and being deceitful is something that he's against. Mm -hmm. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walks after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow, and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another. So what is this? Adultery, mm -hmm. right? 
doing this with your neighbors. You see how long ago this was? Mm -hmm. This is another one of the commandments, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And let others bow down over her, for that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. If I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complain against me, what then shall I do when Elohim rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Do you see? So he had to listen to the man and the male servant, uh, the man servant and the female servant, because they would bring a mm -hmm. cause to him. And he had to administer the right judgment when they complained. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, continue. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? If I have kept the poor from their desire, or caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it, but from my youth I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, and if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall off from my shoulder. Now, now, now before you finish, because you're really going in. <laughs> you see, all of these things are part of the law. Mm -hmm. It's part of the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. Is this, are these bad things? Um, feeding the fatherless? Mm -hmm. You know, making sure the widow is, is taken care of? Making sure the lack of clothing? What's wrong with these things? This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is, this is what makes people upright and perfect. Mm -hmm. Continue. Let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from Elohim is a terror to me. And because of his magnific magnificence, I cannot endure. If I have made gold my hope, or said to find gold, you are my confidence. See, so we're supposed to be not looking at the riches. Money mm -hmm. is a problem, right? This is what he's talking about here. Mm -hmm. This is what the Messiah was talking about. Go ahead. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness, so that my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied Elohim who is above. If I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me... Ah, stop. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Is this one of the things that mm -hmm. talks about evil? Yeah. The evil person who hated me. Mm -hmm. He's saying, if I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me, or lifted myself up when evil when, when evil found him, indeed, I have not allowed my mouth to sin. It's a problem for him hoping that something happens to this person. Do you see how this is one of the elements that, the Messiah is talking about when we're hating evil or our enemies. This is what he's talking about. He already had this built into him years before the Messiah came. Continue. Or lifted myself up when evil found him. Indeed, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. If the men of my tent have not sinned, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner has a lodge in the street where I have opened my doors to the traveler. 
if I have covered my transgressions as Adam. Oh, oh. He called out Adam just uh, a few seconds ago. By hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of family, so that I kept silence and did not go out of the door, oh, that I had one to hear me, here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince. I would approach him. If my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. And that is why he is considered perfect, upright, and blameless. What do these things seem to have in common with a blameless and upright person? He seems to always, or she seems to be always, helping the people, which is what the Messiah keeps talking about over and over. He is showing love to people when he's helping them. Let's look, let, uh, let's look at a couple of other people that are considered blameless in the scriptures. Luke 1, 5 to 9. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before Elohim, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahuwah, Blameless. How is that possible? Everybody keeps saying, I'm sorry, everybody's not saying this. People are saying, that's impossible. Why is it written there if it's impossible? It's written in the scriptures. Do you believe it or not? Do you think that they're lying here when they said they did this? Read that part again. And they were both righteous before Elohim walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahuwah, blameless. So there is a person in the New Testament that did this, right? There's two of them, a man and a wife. And you know when you have a wife and when you have a husband, y'all are going to bicker. Yeah. So is that what they're talking about? No. No. Are they talking about these guys never sinned? No. no. Because all have sinned and and has fallen short. Mm-hmm. So that can't be it either. Right. So they were doing what Job was doing, what Abraham was doing, and what some of the others were doing that were called perfect, upright, blameless. They were doing it here too. Mm-hmm. New Testament. Go ahead. But. but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before Elohim in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of Yahuwah. And if you guys don't know this, this is where John the Baptist or the baptizer, parents, because they were blameless, Mm. they were blessed with a child. That was to go before the most, I was going to say the most high, the Messiah, before him, Mm -hmm. right? This is the one that cried out in the wilderness, make straight the way. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Psalms 18, verse 20 to 24. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of Yahuwah, who spoke to Yahuwah, the words of this song on the day that Yahuwah delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Yahuwah rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of Yahuwah and have not wickedly departed from my Elohim. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. 
I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore, Yahuwah has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Does that mean that he's never done anything wrong? Nope. No. That's not what the perfect and purpose thing is. Wow. But because we have a worldly understanding of what it is, he gave us the seed by the wayside, and at any given time we can be one of the seeds. But then when we're doing right, we are perfect before him. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get down to how to do this in, in a little bit. Let's go with uh, Matthew 1, 18 to 21. Now the birth of Yahushua Messiah was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Uh-oh. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. Oh, this is, remember, just man or just means blameless, mm -hmm. means perfect, means upright. Mm -hmm. Continue. And not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. Do you see how he didn't want to cause a big deal about it and embarrass her and, and do all these things? He tried to do the honorable thing with her. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of Yahuwah appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yahushua, for he will save his people from their sins. Okay. So, you see, a just man was picked for Mary. Mm-hmm. Right? Because if you don't, what happens? If you pick somebody that's unequally yoked, not going to work. Mm -hmm. So, have you seen that these people seem to be equally yoked with each other? No. Yeah. When you look at Sarah, when you when you look at uh, um, the, the Zacharias and Elizabeth, and when you see here, these people are equally yoked. Yeah. Anybody less would have tried to get a stone. When we talk about the commandments uh, a lot of the time, the reason why people have some issues is the first four commandments. <laughs> right? Yep. Because they keep saying, which commandment shall we keep? This is what they were asking the Messiah, mm -hmm. which we'll see in a few. In, in a few. But let me just reiterate the first four. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols, nor bow down and worship it. You shall not misuse the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You shall not remember, you shall remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. The reason why those are not mentioned is because you should already be doing this. If you are a believer, you already don't have any other gods before you. So he knows this, right? Because everybody says, well, he knows my heart. Well, yeah, he knows that you love him, but the other people are the issue. This is what we talked about last week. Loving everybody else is the issue. It tells you in the original scriptures, the Sabbath day, keep it holy perpetually. That means forever. It does not change. Do you think that respecting your mother and father changes? Do you think that committing, com committing murder changes? No. These things don't change. Neither did the first four change. But he's emphasizing what we just heard about in Job and what we heard about in Abraham. Those aspects to them and what we heard about Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were walking blameless because it said they were. So now let's go to that scripture where the young ruler is talking to the Messiah. Matthew 19 
verse 16 to 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is Elohim. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Okay, do you see that the Messiah cut it off right there at first and said, keep the commandments? This guy should know what keeping the commandments are, right? But he went one step further. I want to make sure that people understand that he said, keep the commandments. That means all of them. That's what he said. This is, and, and this is not, this is not about just keeping commandments type of, of uh, talk today. It is to get you to understand what perfect is, to get you to understand what blameless is, how to get to that point to where you would be considered blameless or perfect. Continue. He said to him, which ones? Usually said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Stop. All right. So we saw Abraham doing this, and we saw Job doing this. That's what they said, right? They didn't even have the things written in stone yet, but that's the things that they were doing because when you're doing good things to other people, you don't have evil thoughts. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still like? Yushua said to him, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. Do you, do you want to know why he said come and follow him? Because this man kept the commandments. He did these things from his youth, and all he had to do was sell the stuff and follow him. If he knew who he really was, then he would have had no problem with that. But because of the riches that he had, it clouded his judgment. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. He wanted him to come follow. That's a great honor yeah. that he said, come and follow me. You all worthy to follow me. I know that you'll keep my commandments when I tell you. But what does it say happened? But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And when we talk about when we talked about um, the enemies of Job, what was he saying? The same thing in Matthew five forty three to forty eight about the enemies. What does it say? You have heard that it was said, "You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy." But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? All right, so here we are getting to the point. What's the point? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. All right. So loving your enemies and doing this can cause you to be perfect. He's, mm -hmm. he's teaching you right here what it takes to be perfect. Do you hear him quoting pork and animals and things that you should or should not be eating? Is he quoting any of those things? He's telling you what you need to be to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Let's go at Romans two twenty one. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? 
You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? So we can't be a hypocrite either, right? That's right. So if we're stealing and we tell our kids, uh, don't steal, that's one of the commandments, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's look at Proverbs 30, 7 to 9, and let, let's hear what they say about stealing. Two things I request of you, deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. So, do you see that the Messiah says, be content of what you have? Yeah, exactly. This is what this is saying. Continue. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is Yahuwah? Ah, uh, see? When you become prideful when you get a lot of money, you start forgetting things because you're living a good life, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my Elohim. So now you understand, you're starting to understand what happens when you're poor. When you don't have anybody to give you things, stealing becomes the option, right? When we read Proverbs 6, 30 to 31, this is what it says. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. Yet when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. So what does this have to do with being blameless? I will tell you what the catalysts are. When you have fatherless children that run around, they have nowhere to go, they start stealing to survive because they're starving. If you are a good person and you're helping them, then it's less likely for them to steal. Mm -hmm. You still have people that are bad that will steal anyway, but it's less likely. The Most High has put it in his commandments, his ordinances, for us to do certain things, and I'm going to show you that. This is what helps you become perfect. The definition of glean, um, with the synonyms. Obtain, get, take, draw, derive, extract, cull, garner, gather. Continue. Collect gradually and bit by bit. As in objects gleaned from local markets, historical gather, leftover grain or other produce, after a harvest. As in the conditions of farm workers in the 1890s made gleaning essential. Okay. So one of the gleanings is getting stuff and gathering it, right? Mm -hmm. Let's see what the Most High talks about in Leviticus. So you can do the name system. Leviticus 19.9, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leviticus 19.10, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Okay, why? Why should you do that if it's yours? Because the people will probably steal from you. Mm -hmm. And helping this helps them mm -hmm. survive. And then what do they do? Somewhere down the road they get a job? All they need to do is survive and weather the storm for a little bit, mm -hmm. and they were able to do this. Do you see that Job helped the strangers, the feeble, the weak? Yeah. Leviticus is saying the same exact thing. Next week. Leviticus 23:22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Does this sound like a bad thing to you? No. Uh, when, when, we, when we talk about the law, this is part of what's in the law. Is that bad? Is that bad that you want to help out the poor? You're keeping them from sinning. So let's go with Deuteronomy. 24, 21. 
When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. So let's equate that to today, right? Because most people are not farmers today. Do you know what happens to the fatherless? Do you know what happens when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing? You start to hear the fatherless, fatherless of today get into gangs and become drug dealers because they have no dads. They have moms, but they're running around out in the streets because the mom has to work a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. People call people deadbeat dads for, for reasons. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why it's so hard on the dads than it is the mothers. A lot of mothers get away with a lot of different things using their children against them sometimes. But men also are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and the scriptures will let you know why. So the gang members, when they become gang members, what do they do? They steal, they rob, they murder. Some become drug dealers. Some become drug dealers to help their moms out, right? Mm -hmm. Because those are the circumstances of today, right? They're not in the fields. This is what you consider the fields. The fields that are supposed to be the gleaning of today are the churches, the congregations, the homeless shelters, and all other organizations that will help the fatherless, the widows, and those type of things. That now becomes a field. Because if we didn't have these homeless shelters, if we didn't have these churches, if we didn't have these congregations, there would be a lot of thievery and problems mm -hmm. and maybe even murder because they're trying to survive. Mm -hmm. So you can see today what we need to be doing. That's what helps you become blameless and a perfect person. Continue. Mm -hmm. Does not, uh, let's see, First Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is why men have it very hard when it comes to needing to pay for their kids because the scriptures say so, which means the most high. Wow believes that if he is not doing what he's supposed to be doing after fathering a child, then there's a problem because what does it cause? It causes uh, people to be thieves. Yeah. It causes people to do other things that they wouldn't ordinarily do mm -hmm. because the father is not doing it. Where is uh, the love? The love is not there for some of them. But this is not with all dads, and this is not with all women. Mm -hmm. This is with believers that we're talking about. This is what they're supposed to be doing. If you are a believer, then you're supposed to be providing for your own. Mm -hmm. That's that's what it says in the scriptures. That makes you perfect. Philippians two fourteen to fifteen. Do all things without complaining. All right. Can you can any of y'all do this? No. Because <laughs> I, I try. I complain, that's why you have to yeah. repent, right? Yeah. Because once you know that you're doing things that you really shouldn't do. Well, we can do it, we just may not be doing it right now. Yes. Because it is possible. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> so, you got to start with 14 again. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless. Uh, so that's a part of being blameless. Yes. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Uh, but, we can do this. But listen to me. How many of you people have you heard that has not complained about someone? Because it's not we're usually not complaining about the most high. I don't we're think complaining I've ever about met such a person. We're complaining about each other. So he's saying, if you want to become blameless, that's what you do. So those other people, they had to have been doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what causes them to be blameless. Go ahead. And harmless. Children of Elohim without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation 
among whom you shine as light in the world. So let's see what they're supposed to be doing when they become the new men and the new women. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32. We're getting close to the end. This I say, therefore, and testifying in Yeshua, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, and the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of Elohim because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Messiah. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Yahushua, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupting according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to Elohim in true righteousness and holiness. So hate needs to be put away yes. in order for you to be blameless. Hate, which is what people think that they're talking about, but they're not. There are people that do sinful things. Should we hate them? We hate the sin, right? Right. Of the things that they're yeah. doing, and we tell them about it. Yes. Right? The people think you can't rebuke or anything like that, and we had talked about that one Sabbath, and we showed that you can do that because it says in the scriptures to do it. That we're supposed to be doing that, rebuking people when they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. The thing is, we have to be blameless as well, mm -hmm. and not just to be a, a hypocrite exactly. doing it. Exactly. So we have to walk in the spirit like everybody else, and not grieve the spirit. Let's continue. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt, corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Stop. So it says early on, be angry, but do not sin. So you can be angry, but not sin. Mm -hmm. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So if you're upset at your wife or your husband for something, you cannot let the sun go down without y'all talking about it mm -hmm. because it gives place to the devil. It That's explains right. it here. Mm -hmm. If you do those things, then you're still blameless and perfect. Right. You're no longer stealing. You're laboring for money. And what does it say if you labor for money if you don't steal anymore? Working with hands, what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Mm -hmm. So the person that was stealing is the person that was in need initially. He got a job. Now his duty is to go help someone else. Do you see? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what it's talking about. And then you'll be perfect. Mm -hmm. Continue. Uh, let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of Elohim by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Elohim and Messiah forgave you. Is, are these guys mostly talking about food 
and tassels and shaving. What are they talking about? They're talking about love and helping people the majority of the time mm -hmm. that they're talking about this. So how do we keep the law and still be perfect because people say you cannot do this? I'm going to prove you wrong here. Let's start with Galatians 5.14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Can you do that? Because if yes. you do these things, mm -hmm. then you're fulfilling the law, yes. which you think you can't. Mm -hmm. So let's, Galatians 5.16. Walking in the Spirit. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Messiah. Okay. Do you see? This is the law of Messiah. It's to bear each other's burdens. We're supposed to be working together. That fulfills the law. James 2, 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. All right. So, again, it's explaining to you how to fulfill the law. The people are clamoring all over the place saying, no one can do this. It doesn't seem very hard to me because it, mm. it's explaining what the fulfillment of the law is here. Mm. James 2, 23. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed Elohim, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of Elohim. Look at that. Talks about, it talks about Abraham again, fulfilling what he's supposed to be doing. Romans 13.10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of of the law. Do you see it keeps saying the same thing over and over? These are the people that he's choosing. So let's end it with what we talk about here with Home of Prayer all the time. Mm -hmm. Galatians 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. That is how you become perfect. I pray right. that this was a blessing for the people that were online today, and I am going to give it over to Rabbi. Hello, Rabbi. Are you there, yeah. Rabbi? Did she say something? I think we can't hear you if if you're trying to speak. But yes, it had it had kind of got me out of where I was. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. Hallelujah. Uh, I just, um, again, thank our Heavenly Father for the wonderful teaching. I'm always learning and then reminded and confirmed yet again how the Father is bringing, bringing the truth and also uh, letting us know that following the spirit of truth helps us to be blameless before the living God. Thank you both very much for that awesomeness. I am not going to say but a few things um, because you've covered, just covered everything wonderfully in the Holy Spirit. And I'm so grateful to Father for this awesome breakdown of blameless and being and perfect. So what I'm going to do is... Um, I'm going to read uh, something this has to do. Let me just read it about the blameless. 
they talk always about the blameless Ethiopian, so it'll be um, an additional um, additional information, maybe for some, and maybe some already know. But the Ethiopians was uh, was called the blameless Ethiopians. It says the ancient Greeks called them the blameless Ethiopians because they were considered the most devout people on earth. Ethiopians, it's spelled A-E-T-H-I-O-P-I-A, was where it says Zeus and the other gods went to feast and rest, but that was about where the pleasantries ended. Ethiopia is the graveyard of conquerors, Egyptians, Persians, Romans, Arabs, Ottomans, Italians. Ethiopia has been uh, sending um, them back in uh, orange and coffers and body bags for over 4,000 years. And um, another uh, thing is said about the uh, blameless Ethiopians. It says it has been, and we know they weren't called E-T-H-I-O, but it was Kush, K-U-S-H, and C-U-S-H. It says it has been reported that Ethiopia has more people who keep some version of the seven-day Sabbath than any other country on earth. And then uh, this particular write-up says that um, Sabbath in Ethiopia has been kept from the days of Nimrod in Genesis 10, verse 8 and 9. And that is 700 years before the birth of Moses. Africans or Ethiopians have been Sabbath observers from the days of Nimrod. You and I know it goes back further than that, but that is just another one of the writings. And then it's also said that um, that the uh, they have ten principles of the blameless Ethiopians, and of course you know uh, that they they keep uh, kept the commandments. And this is just ten principles. And among the ten principles, it says, covet no land or riches that the supreme being does not naturally grant you. Number two, respect the opposite sex as your equal and your complement. Number three, give unto the world what you would have the world give unto you. Four, always seek balance in all things, for only in harmony can there be growth. Five, Honor your ancestors, especially those who sought justice and balance in their, in their time upon the earth. Six, seek not simply to do good, but in, uh, encourage others to do good as well. Seven, always seek higher wisdom in all of life. Number eight, honor and safeguard the children who have come to forge the future of the country. Nine, Seek to be part of a brotherhood, sisterhood, or group, for we accomplish more together than alone. Number 10, have no tolerance for evil and injustice so that you will forever be known as blameless. blameless. And uh, this is from the African blood, what I'm getting ready to read here. It said the fame of the Ethiopians was widespread in ancient history. Herodotus described them as the tallest, most beautiful, and long-lived of the human races. And before Herodotus, Homer, and even more flattery, well, Homer understood it had to do with the Greek Bible, uh, is an even more flattering language, described them as the most just of men, the favorite of the gods. The annals of all the great early nations of Asia Minor are full of them. The Mosaic records allude to them frequently, but while they are described as the most powerful, the most just, and the most beautiful of the human race, they are constantly spoken of as black, and there seem to be no other conclusion to be drawn than that at that remote period of history, the leading race of the Western world was a black race. This is from a tropical dependency, page 221, by Lady uh, Lady Lagarde. 
Okay, just a moment. Um, it's a couple of more things here. Okay, where's a couple more things? Just give me a minute. I just want to put a few things so we can think about it when uh, we are no longer on this land. Okay. And let's go back. We'll just go to Enoch that we we talk about all the time. And the fact that the um, they don't want you to read the book of Enoch and all that other good stuff that all of those of us on the line already are aware of it. So did Enoch live a sinless life on earth before his translation? Because that's what we are actually talking about. Um, the blameless, and can you can you can you follow what Father's given you? So, how long did Enoch walk with Father? And Genesis five twenty two says, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God for over three hundred years after his firstborn at sixty five years of age. He lived three hundred sixty five. Six to five years. What happened to Enoch after he walked with God for 300 years? Genesis 5:23. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. So God translated Enoch after he was 365 years of age. So Enoch never tasted death. Why did Father translate him? What did this, what, what did the spirit of prophecy say? For his faithful obedience to God, he was translated. So also the faithful who are alive and remain will be translated. Because of Enoch's faithful obedience, it is said that he was translated in year 987 after creation, before the flood took place in 1006. 156. As our example, the faithful obedient will be translated at Yahushua HaMashiach, or Jesus Christ's second coming. Revelation 22:14. The faithful obedience who died in Christ, a Messiah, will be resurrected in the first resurrection to be taken uh, to heaven. So we've hearing, hearing so much wonderful teaching this morning to give us hope and a desire that our Father can strengthen us to do better today than we did yesterday. Uh, During those early years, Enoch had loved and feared God and had kept his commandments. Commandments come up all the time. Hallelujah. He was one of the holy line, the preservers of the true faith. If Enoch kept God's commandments, therefore he was sinless. Holy, blameless, undefiled, and perfect, since sin is the breaking of God's law. 1 John 3, verse 4. And he is not breaking the law of God. So we we are hearing uh, the fact that this started all the way back there with this particular man that was also writing books and not just one book. It's a number of books and that that is out there and we don't we are up to three that we have found but but there he wrote a lot. The the godly character of this prophet represents the state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth. Revelation fourteen verse three. At the time of Christ, a Messiah's second event, Enoch was sinless because he kept God's law. So we need to take note of his character of those to be redeemed from the earth at the time of Messiah's second coming is going to be the same as Enoch's. Hallelujah. Now, um, did he teach people? At this time that the law of God can be kept and a sinner's life is possible. 
men were taught that it is possible to obey the law of God, that even while living in the midst of the sinful and corrupt, they were able by the grace of God to resist temptation and become pure and holy. And isn't that what it said? Be ye holy, be ye perfect, even as I am perfect. Not only did he not live a sinless life, but he was a faithful teacher of righteousness by faith. He lived about 600 years before the flood. He, as what it says here, he is our example of living a life without sin. Did he not declare himself sinless? Who who declared him? Enoch did not make a claim that he is sin, sinless. God said, Enoch walked with him over 300 years. It was God who declared Enoch sinless. And he translated him to heaven. Enoch's translation is a rebuke upon those who do not believe that we can live a life without sin by divine grace. By translating Enoch to heaven, God also demonstrated that the sinner will not be uh, taken uh, to heaven. No one will be saved in sin. Whoever is saved will be saved from sin. For anyone today to keep saying that we cannot live a holy life, a perfect life, a righteous life by divine power, he or she is degrading the power of God and is also contradicting the scriptures. For anyone to keep saying that we will continue to sin until Jesus, Yahushua, or Yeshua, or Yahushua returns to take us home, he or she is believing a lie. And his or her destiny, well, will be hell. It says here, well, if we don't do what the scripture tell, tell us to do, we know what's happening. May ye, uh, Enoch's sinless life be an encouragement and a lesson for us, since God will take only the righteous to heaven. When Jesus Christ, a Yahushua HaMashiach, returns, Revelation 22, verses 11 and 14, we have heard today uh, examples of Job and and various others, and you have uh, in the New Covenant, the Messiah, the disciples, Abraham, and various others you have heard today. That Father told Noah and those to walk perfectly or that they were perfect. And so what Father is saying to us as we are to keep, keep, we're doing repenting. And because this is the time of repentance where we repent every day. So Father is showing us that these things are possible and he has given us examples to follow our Abraham, our Isaac and our Jacob. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to read uh, some, a few other things here and it, it may not mean a lot right this moment, but it's, it has to do with what Homer said about the Ethiopians. Remember, he was part of, I think he either wrote it, uh, don't quote me, but because I had gotten something that um, he had something to do with the Greek the Greek Bible, but I didn't get that here to, to uh, read to you exactly what it is. But it said in the Iliad, Thetis is speaking to Achilles. And said, only yesterday Zeus went off to the ocean river to feast with the Ethiopians. Loyal, lordly men and all of the gods went with him. It's just to illustrate that they were talking about these, these blameless people and how they, uh, I, many of us have heard about Poseidon. I had to do a paper on Poseidon and I had no idea what I was doing when I, after I got to know what was going on in the scripture. But Poseidon had gone to visit the Ethiopians, and this is probably a myth or something, so you can look it up. But anyway, Poseidon had gone to visit the Ethiopians worlds away, Ethiopians off at the furthest limits of mankind, 
a people split into one part where sun god sets and part where the sun god rises. There Poseidon went to receive an offering and bulls or whatever, and I don't need to go any further. I think that what I shared about uh, Enoch, I think that will add to what uh, Minister um, Brian has also shared. If the Sabbath started with these people, then that ought to tell you something about the goodness and the, the wonderment of our Father and why he would call them the blameless blameless Ethiopian. So you all can uh, Google it and just find out more about it. And I thank our Heavenly Father, and that's all the comment that I'm going to say today because I, I think everything has been covered uh, uh, superbly by the Spirit of our Father using Minister Williams and his wife. So I just thank our Heavenly Father. Father, I just thank you for for what you did add to give us more things to think about. We bless and praise you, and I, I give thanks to you for blessing us this morning. I thank you, uh, Sister Bethany, for the wonderful opening. Thank you, Minister Williams and, and Sister Regina for all that you've done. And I thank all of you that stayed on the line because of the Spirit of Father in you and because Father has set all of us aside on this line and told us to be holy, be perfect as I am. And then he has told each one of us that I will help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. Then he told all of us that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will lead us into all truth. He says, I will strengthen you, and I will be with you, and I will lead you by the way that you sh you should go. And then in the word, when it tells you to put on Messiah, you see that Messiah did not sin. In fact, he took on your and my ugly sins, our dirty sins, and the way that we were, and he cleansed us and washed us with the living eternal water, and he strengthened us, and he chose us to be his children. And that is a wonderful thing right there that he chose us. And I want to uh, read, let me see, Isaiah. I think it's Isaiah 11, 2. Let me see, 11, 2, and then that will be it, where it says, uh, 11, 1 and 2, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of Yahuwah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom. So you have put on Messiah. So the Holy Spirit is resting up on all of us, and through us the gifts of the spirit is also operating word of knowledge, wisdom, etc., etc. The spirit of wisdom here, and then how do you get understanding that that all this is up on the Messiah, and we have accepted Him. So, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel. So it means that Father can counsel anybody He desires to counsel through any one of us that's on this line. And might, and the, and the word might is also strength, so he gives us strength. The spirit of knowledge, it is said that my people perish for lack of knowledge. And if you don't have knowledge, then you don't understand the workings of the mighty God of Israel. You will not believe that he is still healing in this day and hour on his Sabbath. You will not believe that you have to keep feast days and he listed Sabbath number one in Leviticus 23. That's head, head the list because on that day we worship and the Father and it is also a sign that we are connected to the God who created heaven and the earth and the sea. And then lastly and of the fear of Yahuwah. If you do not fear the heavenly Father, you are not going to obey what he gives to us. And it starts in the home with father and mother. 
there's a certain honor that we have for them. We don't like for them to see us doing wrong things. Or sometimes we go out and we may not, we may disappear from them for a while, but as soon as we see them around a corner or something, you know, we are alert because they represent the Almighty El Shaddai. And if you honor and, 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 and fear your, your, your mom and dad in the right way, you know what I mean by that. If you fear father, but you love your parents, but you don't want to do evil to bring heartaches to them. So Father is doing the same thing with us. He wants us to to uh, not want to do the bad things, knowing that it will not lead to good things, because fear causes problems and open us up to negative things. So Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word again this morning. I thank you for all of those that are on the line. As they are on the line, they are all part of your, they brought their temples and they are all part of this one body of believers. So I ask special blessings upon everyone this morning. And also, Father, my neighbor called, and then I'm going to turn it over to let somebody else if you have a word to say. My neighbor called this morning because I had to rush a friend off to the hospital and we prayed this morning and what she was encouraged and she trying to call while I'm on this line and I pray that all is well because they fear in that that he has cancer or something like that so I just pray and and pray you all agree that father is healing his body and restoring and renewing and that they will not find cancer in his body so thank you all everyone and I uh, is there anyone that have a comment or anything? This is the time that you can share a comment. Yes. Um, go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am very blessed with the topic um, that has been picked today. Um, and I, I, I like both of, before I continue, I, I like both of what Sister Regina, or excuse me, all three of you guys, Sister Regina, I love what you shared. Very important. It really went along with what Minister Brian Williams had. Um, for you, Minister Brian, I really took in a lot, and there was a lot to think about, a lot of scriptures that really went down deep um, in my mind. And Rabbi, what you shared, just as important. I really um, was also really focused and really took in what what you were discussing. Um, and, and I really like that we are talking, you know, the, the, the topic was about, um, you know, being blameless and, and upright. I'm glad you talked about this because a lot of people think, and I know this is already said, but I'm just making a comment. Um, uh, a lot of people think that, no, no one can be perfect. Only only the God above can, can be perfect. Well, yeah, he is perfect, but... <laughs> We also can be. It has to do with getting, you know, getting away from sin, um, learning, um, you know, gaining understanding. Once you do, once you depart from from evil, is is a big one. Because a lot of people think being blameless and upright means that you just are, have been that way throughout your life. No, it, it's it's when you're you're doing the right things in Father's eyes is when we are perfect. Um, the, the other thing I, I think a lot of young youth, and, and including myself, um, I guess this may be a little different, but I think it, it, it still goes with what we're talking about. When a lot of times, um, and I'm not saying everybody thinks this way, but a lot of people who don't really understand the word and, and, and things in that nature, um, a lot of people think, well, I've, I've done wrong, so now I'm not father's, um, child. No. Um, the day that we, um, commit to him and accept him as Jesus, Lord, Messiah, how, however you, you call him, you have become his child. And when you do things wrong, that's backsliding, you know, when we're trying to go back to the to the old life before we did that. But a lot of us get so depressed and so upset and disappointed in ourselves that we think, 
now I have to re, you know, accept him into my heart. Now, he's already in your heart. It just has to do with the actions that, that you're doing. I know I thought that way when I was younger. I got in, in some, some trouble. And, um, you know, I was asked, well, what, what have you, you know, a, a, accepted Jesus in, in, in your heart? And I said no. And, I, and that wasn't right because I did. See, I didn't understand how that worked. I didn't really get the whole backsliding thing. I didn't really get what the importance and, 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 and what I said and what I, I've done, you know, earlier before that happened. Um, so we just have to pay attention to, you know, if we are doing right, then we are perfect in his eyes. If we are doing wrong, then, then, then we are backsliding. We're not doing the, the, the things. Um, so I, I just really like this, this topic. It, it, it helps break this. Well, nobody can be perfect. Yes, we can. According to what Minister Brian's scriptures, or excuse me, Father's scriptures that Minister Brian Williams read to us, um, according to what this, this study was, you see that there's proof that we can be blameless and upright. So we have to get that mentality out of our minds that we can't be. That's just, you know, also, in a way, I look at that as not having faith in ourselves. Um, well, well, I can't do that. Well, well, I can't be perfect. Well, I can't keep the Sabbath. I can't do this and that. That I can't will continue to, to, to get in your soul, and it will make you not want to do the right things. And the adversary also uses our thoughts against us. So it's important that we keep saying, yes, I know that I, I can be blameless and 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 upright but we have a tendency to get um when bad things happen and we don't get things we get frustrated and we give up and we think that you know what this is just i i just will never be able to be good no it has to deal with we have to go through tests from the most high we have to go through certain things in life to strengthen us to get us to the point where we are looked at as blameless and upright, but it takes work. And if, if we really love Father, then, then we'll be willing to put in the work to become what our, our, our Messiah is saying that we can be. Um, so that's it. That was, that was my comment. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Father. Thank you for being obedient to Father's Spirit. Hallelujah. Uh, we, we, we bless and, and applaud our Heavenly Father and give thanks to Him for what He, what He has brought through all that lips this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you again for your obedience. And thank you again for highlighting your, your mom's, uh, reading at the beginning, which is absolutely right. It set, it set the tone for everything. Uh, is there anyone else on the line that Again, has a word or something you'd like to share before we go off? I have to come up there. Heavenly Father, uh, we give all honor and all praises. I hope I waited long enough. We give all honor to you as the king of kings and the one that has given us the the uh, words. And, Father, I thank you for giving Minister uh, Williams uh, this topic to share with us today. Now we have on audio, if anybody say that, they are not perfect. We have an audio that we can encourage them to listen to the teaching, and then they will gain understanding. So that gives me great joy, hallelujah, for for this topic, because I do hear that a lot. Hallelujah. So, Heavenly Father, you are our eternal Savior, our eternal salvation. Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, King of the ages, who through Messiah made everything. We bless and thank you, O Heavenly Father, for you are great. 
Hallelujah. Again, you're the almighty one, and great is your strength and of your understanding. There is no numbering. O Creator, Savior, rich in favor, long-suffering, and supplier of mercy, healer, healer of our bodies, our physician, our deliverer, we acknowledge you on this Sabbath day with great joy in our heart. We worship you, for we know that your word is truth. So we worship you in spirit, and we worship you in truth, because we love you. When we hear the voices of our family members and our friends, hallelujah, and believers and sisters and brothers, we rejoice in you that we are in the land of the living. We rejoice in you for having selected us and having called us your elect, because if we were not your elect set apart ones, then the devil would lead us astray. But I want to praise and thank you on this Sabbath, hallelujah, for all the things that when we look back, you delivered us out of it. We are not ashamed to say that, that we weren't doing everything right before we came to know the Messiah. And then we striving, always trying to honor you, always trying to reach out to somebody, trying to help somebody. Hallelujah. If you, you listen to my children and to those on the line that I've known for years, all I hear from all of you is I want to help somebody. What can I do to help somebody? Or you say, somebody came to me in tears and, and I, I, I opened my mouth and you either said God or Yahuwah spoke to me and their lives are changing. Some of you are telling me that that marriage is being put back together, that our children are being delivered from the hand of the evil one because we, hallelujah, we are living in the blameless one who died for us and 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 paid a price. So, Father, hallelujah, in the name of Yahushua HaMashiach, I ask you to bless us going out, Father. Bless us coming in because you are amazing and awesome every day of our lives. And we want you to know that we are thankful. Let your countenance continue to shine upon us. Hallelujah. And be gracious and merciful to us, Father, leading us by the path that we should go. We delight in the workings of your hand. We delight in the wisdom and how you bring things together, and how you've been working out things in our lives. When we thought we couldn't go on anymore, hallelujah, when we miss our loved ones, we thought about you because then you say when your father and mother forsake you, I will take you up. Father, you have kept your word and your promise, hallelujah, to, to the widows and the widowers and to the orphans. There is none like you. So we want to tell you today again that we acknowledge you and we acknowledge that you're the only help, the only one that can put in hearts of people to help us and to be there and to support us. It's because of your love. And we thank you because we feel your love in the arms of our children as they hug us and the sound of the voices of our children as they show respect. There's a certain sound in their voices that say, I respect you, Dad. I respect you, Mom. So we pray for the rebellious ones that don't yet know you. As as, as my son said today, and those the people that just came to know you, some of the Gentiles, they didn't know. They came to the nation of Israel. They came to the people, the, the Hebrew people for which you are the God of the Hebrews. And you gave us the commandments and laws so that we are available to help to lead the people in the right path of light and truth and faith and belief by reading the stories in the word and reading about your people. So, Father, grant us the peace this week. Grant us to understand you still work in many miracles in our lives. Help us not to doubt, not to be double-minded and wavering in our faith. Strengthen us, O Heavenly Father, each and every one of us. And I pray that you grant this week 
awesome blessings to pour forth upon each and every one of us. Oh, Heavenly Father, as a demonstration to the world that we do know the true and living God of Israel, the Elohim of Israel, who gave us commandments and laws, and hallelujah, give us the strength to obey. Forgive us right now for anything any of us have done on this line, if we have done it, and we ask forgiveness, hallelujah, and Yahushua. Now we thank you for your awesome blessing. We pray that we have blessed you, Holy One of Israel. There's none like you, Baruch, Baruch Abba, Bishem, Yahuwah. Oh, Baruch Abba, Bishem, Yahuwah. I, we love you, Father. Hallelujah. So you all be blessed. I'm going off the line because um, everybody on this line know I could go on and on and on and just keep on talking about this eternal king. Thank you for all your teaching today. Be blessed. And shalom be upon each and every one. May Father grant the petitions of your heart. Hallelujah. And know that he never go back on a promise. Hallelujah. Blessings upon all of you. Shalom, shalom, everybody.